I'm Wes Talon, and the focus is on sexual assault awareness. Joining me at the Focus Roundtable are Megan egler Bright, Director of Victim Services for the Douglas County District Attorney's Office. Katrina Harley, Legal Advocate with the Douglas County Task Force. And Laura Angelucci, I got it right, didn't I? Sexual Assault Coordinator with the Task Force. Ladies, thank you for joining me. Thank you for having us. This is a um, very serious subject, so let's start off with the definition. What is sexual assault? Well, Wes, I think when you talk about the classic definition of sexual assault, you're talking about power and control. You're talking about unwanted sexual advances. It could be an acquaintance, um, same-sex, fondling, could be a myriad of things. So. Okay, so are we, we're talking about um, not just the physical um, sexual assault, a, a physical uh, intercourse right. uh, penetration? Yeah, I think that, you know, people have the, the idea of, of rape in their head. It's a term that's been around for a long time and it's been commonly used. And I think over time in the sexual assault awareness movement, we, we did start using this term of sexual assault as sort of an umbrella terminology to refer to that it's not just like you're saying, um, an incident where between a male and a female, where there's certain sex acts that occur. It encompasses, you know, a variety of different unwanted or not consented to sexual contact between any two, two parties. parties. Such as? I mean, it could be between adult and child. Um, we do think of child, you know, child molestation, but that all falls under the sexual assault umbrella. And anything between same sex, um, you know, date rape, like people have heard referred to, or even just, you know, you know, I, I'm, I'm in the, uh, coming from the legal perspective here, so I'm gonna say terms, you know, like sexual battery, where maybe someone in a public place touches someone against their will, or even something like, um, public masturbation or exposing your sexual organs in public could be considered a type of sexual assault. I mean, it, it encompasses so many different things. Yeah, I think the main problem these days is that the main misconception about sexual assault and about terms like rape and molestation is that everybody assumes that sexual assault is this dramatic stranger in a dark alley attacking you out of nowhere, and that's mm -hmm. not often the case, unfortunately. It's a lot more common than that sounds, and I think that's why people don't understand how common it really is, unfortunately, is because they have this misconception about what it entails. Okay, who commits sexual assault? Well, that could be a myriad of people. I mean, it could be a pastor. It could be a, a well-known entity in our society, a well-known and respected entity in our society. It could be a boyfriend, a girlfriend. You know, there, there, there's no idea of what sexual, uh, a sexual assault um, perpetrator looks like. You know, there, there's no common form as far as what a sexual assault perpetrator looks like. You know, it could be your neighbor. It could be, you know, your child's coach. Yeah, more often than not, it's someone who has access to that person. Mm -hmm. You know, like, like Laura said, we think of it as being, you know, someone that we don't know is going to jump out from behind a bush, you know, with a gun and, mm -hmm. and sexually assault us against our will physically. But m more often than not, like Katrina started off with, it's about that dynamic of power and control. And um, perpetrators of sexual acts usually have you know, this, this dysfunction of needing to assert their power over other individuals and, you know, a sexual act is the ultimate act of asserting your power over someone. And that's why we hear about things like, you know, inmates being raped or sexually assaulted in the jail. It's about a power dynamic of one person asserting their position over another. And that's why it does happen within marriages too. I mean, right. people, by law now, thankfully, you know, we've made some progress in the movement to where people know that, you know, you can rape your spouse just because you're married, um, you know, legally it's still a crime if you're having sex with that person against their will. Um, and, yeah, and a lot of times it's who the victim trusts. Mm -hmm. 
you know, a lot of times there's already a trusting relationship that's established. So um, a lot of times I think we have this, this television image of what, of what sexual assault looks like, what a, what a perpetrator looks like. We have what, what, what is deemed as real rape is, is what, it, what we call it, you know, what a real rape victim looks like. Okay, so that's the CSI shows and the, mm -hmm. the, the SVU and the, the, the things yeah. like that that you see on television. On other. Why don't we hear more about sexual assault? Well, I think, like Katrina was saying, when we have this archetype of what uh, the perpetrator looks like, what a perpetrator is like, and then what a victim is like, we do this huge disservice to victims and we create this culture and this almost story of how it's supposed to go. and when an individual, when a victim feels like they don't fit in that story, they feel like they don't have a right to come forward. And a lot of things we see in media, a lot of things we just hear in our culture that we hear people talk about in common conversations that we see on TV, read in the newspapers, make victims think they don't have a right to speak up because they don't fit that archetype because they weren't perfect. Or, yeah, I mean, you think about the press and the way that they cover, you know, high-profile cases of sexual assault, where women claim that they were raped or sexually assaulted in some way by someone who maybe is a, you know, a public figure or an athlete or something, and how they're drug through the mud and their reputation is thrown out there and they're made to look like, oh, they just want to pay off and they're painted, we're, we're attacking the victims, and that's why. Vilified. Yeah, they're vilified. They're made to look like, and, and imagine a young woman at home who was sexually assaulted, um, and she thinks, well, if that woman's not believed, then no one's going to believe me. I don't want to go through what she's going through. And so there's this idea that they're, they're scared to report it before, you know, it even happens sometimes. You know, they look back and they think about, a case that they heard about and they're like, you know, if this is how victims are treated mm -hmm. or survivors of sexual assault are treated when they come forward, you know, I, I don't want to do that. Right. I think that's what the biggest issue is in the way that we look at sexual assault and rape and molestation and all the terms that go under that is that there's a whole lot of focus on the victim but not in a good way, not the way that we're trying to direct it. There's focus on the victim like there's any kind of responsibility there and that's never ever how it should be looked at because when you think about it logically the responsibility is on the perpetrator it should not be on the victim but that's not how it is and that's why victims don't come forward as often as people think they should okay. so these you know i started off with a question on why don't we hear more about it so obviously these numbers are and these instances are un underreported. Mm -hmm. Uh, what are the statistics? Do we have any statistics? So when you, when you talk about um, victims reporting uh, sexual assault, uh, many times um, when they get home and they talk to folks uh, in their, their families, you know, their friends, they begin to question themselves and, and start to, to think about, you know, well, why, why was I out so late? Well, why did I drink this or why didn't I do this? Um, so when you talk about statistically, uh, you're talking about anywhere from, I would say, 60% of victims not reporting, not reporting to police. When I was doing the research for this show, I found that one in four girls mm -hmm. and one in six guys experience some form of sexual abuse before they turn the age of 18. Okay. This is disturbing. Mm -hmm. And then we're talking about inside the marriage and things like that you brought up, mm -hmm. Megan, different things like this. If you can get them to talk, who should they tell? I, I, I've said this as long as I've been in the field. <clears throat> My experience is that the very first person that a, that a victim tells is, is key. Because if that first person that they tell doesn't believe them or doesn't encourage them or support them, it won't go beyond that person. So that's why I feel like the awareness piece is so important because you need to know what to say to your sister, your mother, your friend, your you know, daughter when they come to you and they tell you that this has happened to them. You need to know how to react because that is so key. You know, And, and I think that's where my passion in this area lies is because, you know, 
when I was in college, um, one of my best friends was sexually assaulted. And by the time she told me, it had been a year. And she had just gotten to the point where she realized, I can't just push this pet to the back of my mind. This happened to me and I gotta process it. I have to heal from it in some way. And the reason why she never reported it to the police is because her roommate that she told that very next day what that happened questioned her. She said, well, are you sure? Well, he would never do that. Well, right. what, what exactly do you remember? And all these questions started coming because her friend, very well-intentioned, you know, was just trying to help her figure it out. Mm -hmm. But what she didn't understand is that, you know, those, those, those words that you say in the beginning are so important. And so I think that whoever the first person is that they tell, they need to support them and say, I believe you. This Sorry, is not you. okay. Absolutely. You didn't do anything wrong. Let me help you figure this out. What would you like to do? I think, you know, we should we should tell somebody this person should be held responsible. Can I help you do that? After talking to a person you trust, your best friend, mm -hmm. um, your parent, what, whomever you need to talk to on that, and they're not believed, what should they do? Keep going. They should keep telling the next person down the line anybody that they think might believe them, that they think might support them, and that unfortunately is not the knee-jerk response. That's not intuitive because when that first person looks at you and says, mm, are you sure? I'm not sure. I believe you. Mm -hmm. Like like we've all been saying, it, mm -hmm. it really takes a blow to that victim and they're not going to want to keep going. But this person who's been abused is, is not in a place where they feel confident, where they feel strong, where they feel empowered. So they have to know, and that's what this whole awareness movement is about, they have to know that they've got to keep telling because they're worth that effort. It's about them. It's not right. about figuring out what they did wrong. It's about making sure that they're okay. It's about making them believe that they are worth all the effort and the confidence that it takes to get help for themselves. I mean, part of the awareness piece is getting society to look at how women in particular are objectified. Mm -hmm. So if you, if you can make um, a woman look like an object instead of a person, then it's not as important. You know, and, and so what we need to start doing is, is making victims and survivors feel important. We need, to, we need to, as a society, start by believing. Start by believing, like that needs to be an education piece worldwide. Start by believing. You know, don't start asking the questions to vilify the victim. Start by believing. How do you do that? If someone comes to you and says, I am the victim of sexual assault, it happened last night, whether it's a man or a woman, we've talked mainly about women mm -hmm. here, but men are also, Absolutely. can also be mm -hmm. victims Absolutely. on that and someone comes to you as a trusted friend or family member or something like that, what do you say? How do we help these people? You empathize and you say, what can I do to support you? Because the one thing that you don't want to do, like Megan said, is start asking a whole bunch of questions mm -hmm. that make the victim or survivor feel like they've somehow done something wrong or make them start to second guess themselves in, in, you know, as, as if they were a party to what happened to them, mm -hmm. you know. So, you know, you, you, you support. Okay, and so you, then what's the next step after that? You've confided in a friend, a family member, or something like that. So, you know, that's all well and good, but what's the next step? That's the part that's really hard about this and that why the show is so important and the awareness is so important is because people get to that point and they said, great, I've told somebody, now what do we do? It happened a year ago, mm -hmm. it happened months ago, it happened 10 years ago what do I do now? Some people, th the first thing they think is I call 911. That is an option sometimes, but if it happened a year ago, if it happened mm -hmm. a long time ago, that's when they don't know about things like how the DA's office could help, how they don't even know about a Douglas County task force, mm -hmm. you know? And mm -hmm. that's why this kind of stuff is so important because they don't realize that there are people out there who are employed to be there for them and to help them and give them the right. services that they need. They don't know about support groups, right. you know, that, that mm -hmm. they're not the only ones that have gone through this, that there are other uh, people mm -hmm. that have gone through this that can be there to support them 
in their journey along the way towards their healing. Well, and we're in a society that's, I mean, it's all, um, you know, social media and, and technology. And um, I mean, when we need anything now, the first thing we do is get out our phone and Google it. Yeah. And um, the good thing is, is there is, you know, a state network, the Georgia Network to End Sexual Assault, mm -hmm. um, that has a list on their website of all the rape crisis centers in the state and who you should call that's closest to you. And then there's an advocate on, on that can answer that phone 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You know, they all are required to have hotlines so that mm -hmm. somebody can talk to you and tell you what your options are. You know, calling a, a sexual assault center doesn't mean you're going to end up on the witness stand one day. Right. You're taking steps towards taking ownership of what happened to you and being able to make choices yourself of, okay, what do I want to do with this information? Do I want to go to the police? Do I want to just, do I want to go through a sexual assault exam? You know, or a rape kit, as people have heard it referred to probably. Um, do I, do I want to just have it documented with law enforcement or do I want to mm -hmm. tell them that I, I want to move forward with an investigation? I mean, those are things that an, a, a trained advocate who's had hours and hours of training can help them work through. And that is so key and them feeling like, okay, the choices are mine now. Because right. if it gets down the line, there's going to be some choices that aren't theirs anymore. You know, and that's one of the hard parts about my position is I'm usually working with victims by the time a warrant has already been taken mm -hmm. and the case is in our office. And we are, have a responsibility as the prosecution office to protect the whole community. And so, you know, even though this victim has been traumatized and they've been through so much already leading up to this point, we have to tell them we got to talk more. We got to talk about this more. This case is going to go on for a year or two years, and you might have to get up in front of a jury and testify. And those are a lot of things that they're not going to have choices about. So in the beginning, when they talk to an advocate like one of these ladies, it's so important for them to know you have choices, and we're okay knowing that a lot of these cases might not end up in our office right. because we're about you know empowering these women to make choices and to take their lives back. But when they do get to our to the point of prosecution, we're, we're going to protect the community and we're going to seek justice mm -hmm. for what has been done and hold these offenders accountable for their actions so that that's the only way we can really stop this is to know that we're taking steps towards holding people accountable for what they've done. Absolutely. And then just to add, I was just thinking while you were talking about social media, actually uh, Apple has uh, added to Siri uh, the ability now for um, for a victim or survivor to say, I have been raped, and it will uh, automatically bring up the Nas National Sexual Assault Center on their mm -hmm. um, iPhones. So I thought that was pretty neat. And I bet a lot of people don't know about a that. A lot of people oh, yeah. don't no. know about <laughs> that. And, well, that seems pretty amazing that, that that has been implemented because we're talking about a traumatic situation here. Mm -hmm. That may be all that they can get out of their mouth. Right are those words and being able to, to do that. Um, and there's, I'm sorry, there's such a s profound sense of shame that comes along with this mm -hmm. from a child all the way up to, you know, we have elders that elders, get yeah. sexually assaulted. I mean, Absolutely. you're talking about the most vulnerable populations, you know, and everything in between. And there's such a strong sense of shame. Like you said, even just saying those words can be too much for someone. Mm -hmm even verbalizing what's happened to them. And that's why it is good that there's stuff on the internet. And mm -hmm. you know, there is the, the RAIN, which is the Rape, Abuse and Incest National Network, mm -hmm. um, which is an, on, they have online chat rooms and, and sexual assault advocates that are trained just like us that are online and take shifts being available to talk to 24 seven. So if you're not ready to talk to somebody in person, even on a phone, you can do that in different ways. I mean, I think that's one of those things that people should know about. And the more people that know, the more likely it is that if you go to someone and tell them what has happened to you and you trust them, that they're going to be able to help you find a resource. Yeah. And pastors, counselors, you know, bosses, whoever is in a position to say, I'm not an expert on this, but I'm going to help you get to someone who is. And just recognizing that you don't have to have all the answers if someone tells you this. All you have to know is who to help them get to. That's the beauty of, of the beautiful part about having a, a trained advocate mm -hmm. uh, involved is you, you have a person that's not looking at you with judgment mm -hmm. if, if you're not acting like what society deems as a real rape victim. Mm -hmm. um, because you have people that come in and they're in a very good state of mind or what looks like a good state of mind and people say, oh, was she really raped? 
or was he really raped? And you know, so when you when you're dealing with a trained advocate, you have somebody that whether you come in happy, you come in sad, or anything in between, you have somebody there that's not judging you, mm -hmm. that is professional, that can assist you. Okay, we've talked a lot about uh, women. I want to get because we keep talking about you know the effect of that uh, as a man. I would think it would be extremely difficult mm -hmm. to be able to admit that I have been sexually abused. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not part of the masculine makeup. Mm -hmm. um, it's not part of what society requires right. of a man. Mm -hmm. um, how does that work? Well, what you see with male victims is, is this statistic like we were talking about earlier of all these unreported cases that we never hear about is called a shadow figure in statistics, right? So the shadow figure for male victims is astronomical. It's right. much larger than we can even imagine because a lot of studies have shown that women are more likely to reach out for help because our culture tells women that that's okay. It's okay to have emotions. It's okay mm -hmm. to feel weak sometimes and sometimes it's hurtful and sometimes not. That's another discussion. But for men, it's incredibly hurtful because our culture does not say that to men. Our culture does not tell men that it's okay to reach out for help. Our culture tells men that you suck it up and you mm -hmm. get through yep. it and you shouldn't need help. And that is so damaging to the male victim population, male victims of sexual assault and rape and, and like Megan was saying, from children all the way up to adults, it happens to men, absolutely. And so right. male victims have to know too that there is no shame in it because all of the responsibility, 100% of it, is on the perpetrator, not on the victim. And they're a victim and they're equal to all other victims. It makes no difference whether they're a man or a woman and whether the person that assaulted them is a man or a woman, it doesn't matter. They're a victim and they all deserve attention, they all deserve help, mm -hmm. it doesn't matter. Yep. And one out of 33 men have been mm -hmm. or there was an attempt mm -hmm. made to sexually assault them. And you know, it, it's funny because you were talking about our culture earlier and I'm just thinking, Wes, based on what you said about how, you know, our society really does tell men that it's okay to be sexual and to be sexually aggressive and that men should want sexual contact and that women are supposed to have the sexual boundaries and we're supposed to be the, the gatekeepers, mm -hmm. if, if you will. Mm -hmm. And so for a male to say that a female forced herself on him sexually, mm -hmm. that is so emasculating because everything in our culture and our society goes against that whole notion. It's that like, well, why would you not want her to? Like, why would you right. say, why What's would you say no? What's, What's wrong with you? With you? I mean, a man. Or, or another male. Or oh, especially another male, mm -hmm. yeah, because then you have the dynamic of them questioning their sexual orientation and, right. and do I, do I look like I'm not, not heterosexual? Is that why this happened to me? Or am I not masculine enough? Yeah. Is that why this happened to me? But when we go back to the idea that sexual assault is, is a violent act of power and control. It's not purely a sexual act. It's primarily not a sexual act. Right. And that's one of the things that we work really hard to, you know, educate jur juries on when we do have a case that goes to trial is that, you know, this, you're not looking at, you know, well, why would he want to have sex with her? She's not very attractive. Or he's this public right. figure. He could have any woman he wants. Why would he rape her? So there's all these myths that we have to dispel when we have to try to tell people, you know, sexual assault is not about sex. It's about power and control. It's about mm -hmm. that, you know, idea that I can have what I want. And like Katrina mentioned, dehumanizing women and, you know, objectifying us and making us into sexual objects uh, and men too. I mean, look at Look at any magazine, you're going to see the same thing right. happening to men as women, even mm -hmm. more so now in 2016. And we're all becoming sex objects. Yeah, and, and it's like this thing. idea that, you know, they're just an object to be done with what you want to. And this, this notion that, no, you don't tell me no. I, I'll do what I want to you. And that can happen in any, you know, gender dynamic. Same sex, mm -hmm. opposite sex, male, female, you know, and um, older, younger, you know, that's why it's it's hard to imagine, you know, an, an elderly person being sexually assaulted by a younger person. But that when you go back to the idea of a power oh, dynamic right. mm -hmm. and being able to do what you want to do to that person and thinking that their position person. is not equivalent mm -hmm. to yours. 
Um, you know, it, that, that helps people really wrap their mind around what's really going on here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and another important thing to remember about um, sexual assault and how it works is, like Megan said, it's not about sex, it's about power and control. What it's also about is, it's about, it's about having that control over that other person and it's not healthy. And that's something that's kind of hard for people to wrap their minds around as well, is that you first have to understand that it has nothing to do with sex and you next have to understand that healthy people who are well adjusted and who have healthy relationships are not, do not do this to other people. Do not right. try to force themselves on somebody else. Do not try to have power over someone. Do not try to control somebody. So when a person can wrap their minds around that and think, you know, instead of what did I do wrong? How did I bring this on myself? And look at it like, that's not a healthy thing to do. That's not a normal thing to do. No healthy, safe person to be around would do something like that. Then they can look at it from a point of, now I deserve justice because that person's not safe. And now they can look at it that way. And that's what people have to understand about this is it's not about sex. And it's not something healthy people do. Right. And just to add to that, you know, we have to expand our knowledge and our education beyond no means no. Right. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a little bit more complicated. Actually, it's a lot bit more complicated <laughs> yes, no, than right, that. Yeah, and so we have to definitely expand our involvement uh, beyond no means no. Because if that's where we keep it, then we keep the idea of sexual assault very simplistic. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, and so when you, when you, but when you peel back the layers, almost like peeling back the layers of an onion, when you peel back the layers, it's so much more going on, you know, because like when Megan was talking about um, our elderly population, like some folks would say, well, that's an, that's an old woman or that's an old man. That couldn't possibly mm -hmm. be happening to them. Or they dismiss it as dementia or dismiss it as other mm -hmm. things, you know, but what you're dealing with is a person that is exerting that power and control mm -hmm. over a very vulnerable population of our society. And so, you know, you might be exerting that, that power control over somebody that's not saying no means no, you know, in terms of how we think about things. So our thinking has to go way beyond no means no. And the idea that we call them a perpetrator, I mean, think about what that means. If you just think about that terminology, I, I find myself saying this to, you know, people that I work with a lot on our cases is like, this person, sought out someone mm -hmm. um, and they chose someone that they felt was vulnerable in some way. I mean, we see the same thing in domestic violence, but that is a different topic as well. But you know, um, it, it's the idea that, and I, I have a lot of people that end up, you know, sitting in that chair in my office and they're saying, I can't, you know, I came forward when I found out that he did this to someone else. Mm -hmm. Or when I heard, you know, and a, this is very common with young children, you know, by the, we have these delayed reporting laws that protect you know, people that are adults, but they report sexual assault as children because when they get to an age that they realize he's done this to other children. I, I know that he's done this to more people or she has sexually abused other, other boys and now I'm realizing that, you know, there's a lot of shame that comes with that too. Like, well, if I had said something then, Right. You know, and we have to assure them that, you know, this is not, this is not your fault, but this is why we have a responsibility to tell them that this is not a normal dynamic, like Laura was saying, you know, and that it, it's not about you, it's about them. And if it's not you, they're going to be probably finding someone else to perpetrate against. And that's where the whole idea of stopping the cycle, you know, when we say that, when we're holding somebody accountable and we're putting, you know, you see an article in the news about how the DA's office is putting somebody in jail for 80 years. I mean, that's why, because we feel like, you know, that's how we protect the community sometimes when we have these egregious acts that are, mm -hmm. we can prove and a jury's going to find this person guilty, then we're going to hold them accountable to the fullest extent of the law and show, send that message to our community that we do take this seriously. We're not going to tolerate it. And if you come forward, we're going to support you and we're going to believe you and we're going to see it through to the end. And it starts with, like we said, that first person, then it goes to the next layer of the, mm -hmm. the, the experts and then it goes to the next layer of mm -hmm. law enforcement and then mm -hmm. it comes to us. And it comes to you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And and we got to do the, the part of walking them through some of the really hard stuff again because they're in a way they're reliving that trauma by having to go through it. And, you know, that's why we reiterate 
asking questions in the beginning is not what to do because if you think about how many times along the way they're going to be asked questions and they're going to have to be asked questions. Really traumatizing. The last thing you want to do in the beginning is question them. It's just, like you said, affirm them, mm -hmm. be reflective and empathetic and just say, you tell me how I can help you. I, you know, I care about you and let's, let's work on this together. What can I do to help you? So far we've been talking about reaction to mm -hmm. what happens after the fact and this is obviously a problem so how do we stop this from happening in the first place well the response to a lot of questions like that really on so many topics but especially something like sexual assault is education education is key because like we started this out with what is the definition, that just is a testament to how desperately we need education on this kind of topic, on, on things like sexual education. And, not, and I'm not just talking about the basics and the biological stuff, but I mean talking about things like consent. A lot of people don't even know what I mean when I say that. Mm -hmm. Sexual mm -hmm. consent. Um, this and, goes back to the power and control thing. Right, exactly. Making sure people understand how it works and then talking about healthy sexual relationships and, and all that kind of stuff. It starts with education because you know that we have an issue with education when you know we have to start the show out with a definition. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And um, I mean, bystander intervention. Mm -hmm. So now with, with media, social media, you see so many instances of sexual assault, sexual violence, videotaped by bystanders, mm -hmm. by bystanders. There don't seem to be very many boundaries mm -hmm. these days. Um, going back to your point on consent mm -hmm. and defining what mm -hmm. consent is and the, mm -hmm. the power and control and when parents have the talk, mm -hmm. the birds mm -hmm. and the bees and stuff, mm -hmm. that needs to be part of it. Um, in Douglas County, uh, as we've been talking about here, we're, we're trying to encourage people to report, mm -hmm. yes. even though we're educating and trying to let people know that this is a problem and all. Um, we have the Douglas County Task Force on Family Violence, which the two of you uh, all yes. work for. Mm -hmm. Tell me about your organization. Well, our organization is a nonprofit uh, in Douglas County. All of our services are free of charge. Uh, we do. We have a 24-hour hotline. Um, okay, that's what you were talking about, mm -hmm, Megan. Mm -hmm. So this is reporting, reporting, or just um, anything that uh, a victim or survivor needs. Threats. Threats. Now, if there are threats, we would encourage them that if they are in immediate danger, they need to call 911. You know, we, we never want to uh, be on the phone with, with someone when they are in any kind of immediate danger and they need law enforcement intervention at that time. Uh, but we do, um, we accompany our victims and survivors to court. Uh, we write protection orders and stalking orders. And we are there to just advocate for them and be there with them the whole way through. We're, we're there the whole way through. Right. And it's important to remember, too, that all the populations that get very little attention, we were talking about a lot of people, don't even consider male victims. Another population that's really important to not forget about in Douglas County is our Spanish-speaking population. Mm -hmm. There is, a, unfortunately, a large number of Spanish-speaking victims. And you can imagine English-speaking victims mm -hmm. don't want to reach out for help. Imagine how someone who doesn't speak English very well feels when something like this has happened to them. Man, woman, child, adult, elder, if they don't speak English very well, they're going to think, who's going to help me? No one can help me. There's absolutely somebody who can help them. We have Spanish-speaking services at Douglas County Task Force to help Spanish-speaking victims. Okay. How do they get in touch with y'all? They can call our hotline mm -hmm. uh, any time of day or night at 678-715-1196, and a trained advocate will answer the phone. Now, for the task force, we only, uh, just to, to clarify, we only... Uh, deal with adult victims. So I think that that's very important to, to note. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. On that. Megan, after they go through all this, and mm -hmm. we've, we've made it very clear what the process is right. and all, District Attorney's Office is, um, I don't think people would normally think that a District Attorney's mm -hmm. Office is this involved 
right. in, in this subject matter that, you know, you're thinking about murders and bank right. robberies and, yeah. you know, speeding and that kind of stuff. This is sexual assault. This isn't a subject I would normally think that the DA would have their own section on. Yeah, um, and it's, we've been working for a long time in Douglas County on making this process seamless for victims so that they have some sort of, you know, continuum of care, so to speak. So we have a great rapport with um, the folks at both all of our law enforcement agencies and with the advocates at the task force because we feel like it's important, that communication is so important. And once we got that communication, we started realizing we really need specialized a specialized team in our office that handles these kinds of cases. So um, Brian Fortner at the beginning of his term decided that we we're going to have a Crimes Against Women and Children unit. So that encompasses any of our sex, sex crimes, um, any of our domestic violence cases or child abuse cases, and we have a team of specially trained prosecutors in each courtroom that handle those cases. And um, I'm the special advocate on those cases as well as the director because this is what my background is in. But, um, you know, this is something that we take very seriously in our office. And we like to let the victims know as they come through that they have rights. Everybody hears about the defendant's rights and they have, they're innocent until proven guilty and they have a right to a trial and all this stuff. And the victim's like, what about me? Mm -hmm. And that's where we come in um, and our victim witness unit is teaching them, you know, about their rights as a victim and helping them to exercise those rights, which basically just means you have a right to be involved in this process and to be notified and to be aware and to have your voice heard by the court, to have an advocate walk you through this and answer all of your questions. And um, we also have a Spanish speaking advocate in our office now um, to, to help, you know, bridge that gap with the Latino population because it is growing in Douglas County. And any, like anything, um, a language barrier does com compound any of those issues with reporting and um, not wanting to come forward. So we want all of our community, including that population, to know that you can come and get the services that you need, that you have a right to have somebody that speaks your language you know, I mean, that's that's a pretty big thing for, I it think, is. people to know mm -hmm. is that that's not going to be an issue. You're not going to be turned away from for that reason. Um, so we're excited to know that we have those services in place in um, Douglas County now for really servicing everyone. And um, we also do have access to language lines. So outside of the Spanish speaking population, right. you know, we can help those victims as well. As well. And, um, you know, just knowing that we can take them all the way through the process and and at the end of it for them to know that somebody stood by them and believed them until the end, you know, and parole and all that stuff, we help them through the whole process. Let's address one more issue before I let y'all go today, and that is we want people to report. We want people to take that step, whether it's a, a man or a woman. And we keep talking about trying to protect the victim mm -hmm. through here. Mm -hmm. How confidential does this information stay? Does this person, can this person expect to have their name in the headlines of the local mm -hmm. newspaper the next morning? Well, at the task force, our advocates are bound by confidentiality. Um, Douglas County is a very small community. However, our advocates are bound by confidentiality. When we have a victim walk through our doors, they can be assured that their name is not going to be spread out amongst the community, not mm -hmm. from our office. Mm -hmm. And there are laws in place that protect victims going through the criminal justice process in these kinds of cases. Obviously, any juvenile victim, their identity would be protected. Um, but any uh, rape victim, there are what call, what's called rape shield laws that protect mm -hmm. them from the, the media being able to publish their identity or show their face on the camera. There are certain public documents that come along with um, criminal cases, but we can make all of their contact information private. They have a right to decide whether or not they talk to the media, whether or not they talk to the defense attorneys, um, and uh, honestly, whether or not they talk to us, you know. We still have our obligation to fulfill, to, to notify them, but their identity is protected as, to whatever extent we can. Um, but as far as publicly dispersing their information, we're not able to do that either. See, I think that's important to know because if you, here we are encouraging people mm -hmm. to step up and that we have made it, I think, completely clear that there's help. Mm -hmm. They're not going to get drugged through the mud. 
that we're going to protect them as much as, as we can. Ladies, thank you for the discussion. Thank you for thank the information. You. Very much thank appreciate y'all being. Us. And now I'm going to talk to our audience just for a moment. I think we've made it very clear that sexual abuse is always the perpetrator's fault. Sexual abuse is never okay. If you are able to find it within yourself to report and disclose sexual abuse, you're helping not only yourself, but if you will let these organizations work with you, you're probably going to help ensure that this does not happen by this person to another person. There are people who will believe in you and who will help and support you. It's going to be frustrating and scary, but hang in there. Thank you for watching. I hope that we brought some focus into this subject for you. I'm Wes Talon. See you next time.